Hey everyone, welcome to another video. We're going to be talking about distortion and there's a lot of things that we're going to be talking about. So here's just a quick overview. We're going to be talking about the types of things that can cause distortion. We're going to cover some new terms, thermal expansion, thermal conductivity, the heat affected zone, and then we're going to be talking about the various types of distortion. So how this can be seen in the parts that we're welding. And we're also going to talk about some ways to prevent distortion. Before we start talking about what, it, you know, what causes distortion, how to prevent it, all that kind of good stuff. What is distortion? We need to understand what this is before we can look at its causes and how to prevent it. What it boils down to is when we're welding a piece of metal, as we're applying heat and as it's cooling down, it's going to grow in size or basically expand. And then as it cools off, it's going to contract or basically return to its original size. Sometimes it can change shape. It can take on a permanent deformity. And once this happens, this is what we call distortion. Oftentimes you'll hear someone say, you know, be careful how you weld something. You don't want it to warp. So that's just another way of saying that this, you know, we want to keep this piece of metal from becoming distorted. And so as we start talking about distortion, some of the things that can cause it are obviously the heat. So as we're welding something, we're going to be putting more and more heat into the part. And then of course, how it cools off. Is it cooling down slowly? Is it cooling down fast because we're quenching it or, you know, exactly what's going on? And then, of course, heat and cold uh, leads into expansion and contraction. So there's going to be some push and pull in the weld and around the weld site. And so when we talk about expansion and contraction, we just basically need to remember that as metal heats up, it's going to expand or basically grow in size. As the temperature of the part reduces, the contraction is going to increase. So it's going to try to return to its original size. It's going to shrink a little. So just one more time, as the temperature of the part increases, it's going to expand more. As it starts cooling off, you're going to start to see more contraction. And so let's briefly touch on three different types of metal, carbon steel, stainless steel, and aluminum. The focus of this course is going to be more on carbon steel, but it's good to know about the other two so that way there's something to compare. So carbon steel has the, a medium thermal conductivity rate when compared to stainless steel and aluminum. It also has the lower coefficient of thermal expansion of the three. Stainless steel has a lower thermal conductivity than, uh, than carbon steel and it has a medium coefficient of thermal expansion. And aluminum has a higher thermal conductivity rate than the other two, and it also has a much higher coefficient of thermal expansion. So of the three, we just need to remember that carbon steel has uh, the middle thermal conductivity rate, and it's on the lower end of having a coefficient of thermal expansion. Stainless steel has a lower thermal con conductivity rate, and it has a medium coefficient of thermal expansion. Aluminum is the higher of the three in both categories. And if you're wondering what exactly is thermal conductivity and what does the coefficient of thermal expansion mean, let's start with the coefficient of thermal expansion. This is just a real complex way of saying that the metal is going to expand or basically grow in size as it's heated up. And how much it expands is all just based on the coefficient of thermal expansion. We won't get into the math too much. We're just going to keep to the basics. So if we think of all three different types of metal, if we were to take the exact same size piece for each metal, let's just say it's a six inch by six inch cube for each metal. So if we take a six by six cube of carbon steel and we evenly heat it to the point where it rises a thousand degrees in temperature, this cube is going to expand in all directions roughly one sixteenth of an inch. 
if we were to take the exact same size cube, but for stainless steel, and again, we evenly heat it by about a thousand degrees, it's gonna grow in size by approximately three thirty seconds of an inch. And then if we take the exact same size cube of aluminum, and again, evenly heat it by about a thousand degrees, it's gonna expand roughly an eighth of an inch. So this is just another way to say that aluminum is gonna expand in size more than stainless steel. Stainless steel is gonna expand in size more than carbon steel. And then when we start talking about thermoconductivity, this is just how well that material, that metal, uh, absorbs and distributes heat. So remember, as we're welding it, this metal is heating up. So that metal or that, that heat has to travel. It's not always going to stay right in the welded area or in the immediate area next to the weld. It's going to start traveling through the entire part. And so we can see this in a couple of different ways. Well, we can see some discoloration here, right? So this is one way that the metal is letting us know that that heat is moving away from the welded area. We can also tell that this is happening by uh, maybe accidentally grabbing the piece of metal without gloves. I'm sure it's happened to one or a few of us. And you'll notice that when you pick something up after you've just welded it, even if it's on the edge of the metal, you'll feel some heat whether it's a lot and you burn yourself or it's a little and you can just feel how warm it is that is another example of thermal conductivity that heat is moving away from the weld throughout the entire piece and so these are just a couple of things to keep in mind as we we start talking about distortion how it's caused and how to prevent it so just remember thermal expansion thermal conductivity. And then let's talk about the heat affected zone. So the heat affected zone is the area of material that is right next to the weld. And in this diagram, we have the weld here in blue. This is going to be where the most amount of heat is present in the part. And then that heat is going to want to distribute itself or travel into the entire part. And it's going to, there's going to be a gradient here. Like I said, it's hottest right in the weld. And then it's going to start dissipating into the part. And it's not going to be so hot towards the edge, but you might be able to uh, feel a little bit of warmth. And then there's some other terms here that kind of link back to welding metallurgy. When we were talking about how heat can change the grain structure, we can see that here as there are different temperatures in different areas of the metal it can change the grain structure but for for distortion let's just talk about how or let's just focus on uh, the fact that heat uh, disperses from the welded area into the rest of the part and the area that is immediately next to the weld is called the heat affected zone and so if we go back to the previous slide we take a look at this discoloration. So this discolorated area in the steel is what we would call the heat affected zone. This is where the heat has had the most amount of impact on the material outside of the welded area. And then one last thing, uneven heat can lead to more distortion. And we'll talk about that more here in just a moment. So just a real quick recap, out of the three metals, carbon steel has a medium rate of thermal conductivity, and it's on the lower end of how much it expands when heat is applied. Stainless steel is on the lower end of its thermal conductivity, so it doesn't disperse heat as well as carbon steel or aluminum. And it's in the middle when we start talking about its thermal expansion. So it expands more than carbon steel, but not as much as aluminum. And then aluminum is on the higher end of both categories. It disperses heat a lot better, and it also expands more than the other two. 
And now let's talk about the different types of distortion. So we know that from talking about welding symbols, joints, and positions uh, in, in that module, there are obviously two types of welds, fillet welds and groove welds, and we can find distortion in both. So here's just one example where distortion can be present in a fillet weld uh, depending on if there's just one pass or if there's multiple passes. And as we take a look at both examples, or we can see in this one fillet weld where there is only one pass being made, that there is a little distortion. The forces of expansion and contraction have forced this, this vertical plate to kind of pull towards the weld. And then we see in this example of a fillet weld with multiple passes, there's a lot more distortion here. And that is because as more heat is applied to one side, it's going to expand outward, but then as it cools off, it's going to start pulling everything towards it. And that's why we see this vertical plate being pulled inward towards the weld more than the first weld where there's only one pass. So more heat, equals more expansion and obviously more contraction. So what if we find ourselves in a position where we only have one pass in the fillet weld, but then we see that there is still a lot more distortion? Well, a reason for this could be that even though we've only deposited one weld pass, maybe our travel speed was too slow or maybe our current was too high and we have a lot more filler metal in that weld than what's actually needed. So again, this is gonna lead to more surface area that is being heated up. And so that's gonna lead to more expansion. And then when it cools down, it's gonna have more contraction. So we can still have cases where only one weld is being made, but if the weld is too big, it's going to distort a little bit more, or it's going to want to distort a little bit more. And then let's take a look at a couple different uh, examples with fillet welds. So this is, we're taking a T-joint and we're depositing a fillet weld on both sides. I know it's a little hard to see, but there's a fillet weld here and there's a fillet weld over here. Now in this first example, we can see that the weld is taking place or the weld is being deposited above the center of gravity. So if we were to take this T-joint and find the very center of it or the middle area, and if we were to weld above that, we're going to see that both ends are going to want to pull upwards towards that weld. Now, if we take a different fillet weld joint, and again, we have a fillet weld on both sides. And if we were again to find that center of gravity, which is about right here, you can see this in the image, and we make those welds below the center of gravity, it's going to want to do the opposite. The, the material is going to want to bend downward. So just a couple of more examples of how distortion can occur. Now, if you're welding something that's pretty long, you know, it, it might not be as drastic as this, but this is just showing you that this is the shape uh, that the metal is going to want to take on as it heats up and cools back down. And then let's start talking about distortion in groove welds. We have this first example here of a groove weld being done uh, in a butt joint. And when we're using groove welds, there are two types of distortion that we can see, transverse and longitudinal. Transverse distortion occurs when the forces of expansion and contraction are occurring perpendicular to that weld. So we see that the weld is running lengthwise and the forces of expansion and contraction are gonna wanna pull towards the weld. Okay, so think of trying to pull across to either side. Longitudinal would happen across the length of the weld. And so we can see in these examples right here, transverse 
the the weld the weld joint is going to want to tilt upwards towards the face of the weld so think think of trying to bend this butt joint into the shape of a u or basically trying to shape it into a taco that's one way to think about it and then longitudinal it would be if we were to try trying to take this end and this end and then fold them towards the surface of the weld so either way two sides are trying to to fold up towards each other now they can also fold down if the weld were flipped so in these examples the face of the weld is on top and the root of the weld is on bottom so in both cases they're trying to fold up because the face of the weld is on top if we were welding this say in the overhead position the face of the weld would be on the bottom and the root of the weld would be on top and the way that the metal is going to want to bend would just be opposite. So they would be bending downward. Okay, let's talk about, you know, again, multiple welds versus fewer welds. Distortion can still occur here. So if we take a groove weld and let's say we try to fill it in a little bit better uh, with each pass that we make there's going to be a little bit less distortion because there's less passes. Every single time we deposit another weld, all we're doing is increasing the heat that this part is taking on. We're decreasing the heat buildup. So fewer weld passes means this part isn't going to heat up as much. So there's less of a fight between the forces of expansion and contraction. If we start adding in too many welds, even if we're going, you know, fast or slow, whatever it is, the more welds that we make, the, the higher the temperature is going to be. And so we're going to have more of a fight between the forces of expansion and contraction. So less welds is preferable to more welds. But again, with fillet welds, even if you're making less welding passes, you can still have distortion if those welds are too big. So let's say your travel speed is too slow, or maybe your current is a little bit too high, and so you're depositing more weld material than you actually need, that's still going to raise the temperature of the part, which is going to lead to more expansion, and that's going to lead to more contraction as it cools off. So while having fewer weld passes is ideal, if you make those weld passes too big, that's going to lead to a bigger risk of distortion. So there's a lot of things to think about here. We think about making fewer passes, but we want to make sure that those passes are just the right size. So we can also take into account our technique, things like travel speed, Things like our welding current. So is our current too high? Is it too low? And how that's causing us to make you know, fewer welds versus more welds. And so really quick before moving on, let's just recall that as the temperature of the part increases, it's going to expand more. And then as that temperature reduces, the contraction is going to increase. So more heat equals more expansion. But also with more heat, there's more room for that temperature to decrease, which is going to lead to more contraction. And so like I had mentioned earlier briefly, we can do things as the welder. We can change our technique in order to prevent distortion. So there are things like travel speed, how our current is set on our machine, and a couple other things to take into account, like how big is the part and how thick is the material that we're welding on. If we take a look at this first image, we have three different welds. And so this is three different current settings. So we have our first weld where the current is too low. We have our second weld where the current is too high. 
and we have this third current where our uh, or our third weld where the current is just right for the part. So we can see as our current is too low, we have a lot of buildup. Okay, maybe we have to reduce our travel speed in order to you know actually heat up and melt the material, and this is going to cause us to deposit. Uh, an uneven amount of weld material. So while we may not be penetrating a whole lot, we have a lot of excess material on top, and that is going to affect our material in one way. Now, if we were to increase our current in order to penetrate in and make sure that there's good deposition, if our current is too high, you can see that our weld is really wide Okay, maybe depending on the joint or the thickness of material that we're welding, we don't need this big of a weld. So more heat means more weld material being deposited and a bigger weld is going to lead to more expansion and more contraction. So we need to find a right balance in our current so that way we have just the right amount of weld material or just the right size of, of a weld to hold our pieces together to limit distortion. Now let's take a look at travel speed. We have our first weld here in the second image where the travel speed is just right. We have our second weld where the travel speed is a little too fast, and then our third weld where the travel speed is too slow. So let's start with the slow travel speed. If we're going too slow, we're going to be adding a lot more material than what's actually needed. So we might think that, hey, I'm going to try to put in one pass or two passes versus five or six. But if we're just traveling along too slow, we're adding too much material, which is going to make that weld size really big, really excessive. And that is going to increase the heat in the weld the heat affected zone and the part overall, which is going to lead to more expansion and contraction. If we're going way too fast, we can see that our weld is extremely thin. It's very stringy, and this is going to cause us to have to make more passes in order to fill it in. So more passes also leads to more heat input which is going to lead to more expansion and more contraction. So we need to find that nice or that, that appropriate balance of travel speed in order to make just the right sized weld to limit the heat input. So before moving on travel speed, you want to make sure we're not going too fast or too slow. Going too slow can lead to an excess of deposited filler metal. Going too fast can lead to not enough metal, but it can lead to more welding passes being needed to fill in this weld. If we go to current, too low of a current leads to excess buildup, which can lead to more heat input. Too high of a current also leads to um, too high of a heat input, but also a bigger weld, so there's more area for expansion and contraction to, to occur. And we need to find just the right amount of current to make the right size weld. And so here we just have an example of some really thin sheet metal being welded. And we can see you know, just how thin it is by looking at different views. We can see that the weld itself is very small. So maybe in this case, their travel speed was just right, their current was just right, but because the metal was very thin, the distortion of the metal is going to be a lot more present than it would be in metal that's thicker. So how do we prevent that? What are some things we need to think about to prevent distortion? So here, here are just some things that we can use. We can preheat the metal. We can also apply post heat, still applying heat to the metal after it's been welded. We can use clamps or vices or other fixtures to hold the metal in place while we're welding it 
as it cools, maybe just attack it in place. We can also use alternate welding techniques. So instead of making a full length weld, maybe we just add parts of the weld at a time. Um, instead of a bunch of welding passes, we can limit the amount of passes and we can look at uh, using things that are called heat sinks or chill bars. And we'll take a look at that as well. Let's just start with preheat and postheat. This is something that you want to use whenever possible. It really depends on what the application is. If you're doing something that is uh, going to be inspected to a certain code, maybe you can't use preheat or postheat. But if the code allows you to, then by all means do it. When you're preheating something or heating it before you're welding it, you're going to raise the temperature of the part, but you're going to raise it evenly. That part is going to be just as hot in one area as it would be on the edge or on the opposite side. So as you're welding it, that heat is going to be able to dissipate a little bit more evenly. And so the, the forces of expansion and contraction aren't just going to be focused in and around the weld. So this is just one way to reduce the risk of distortion. Then we can use different clamps to hold the material in place. There's a lot of different clamps that are out there, a lot of different sizes, shapes. There's pretty much a type of clamp for every application. Well, I won't say every application, for most applications. Just holding the material in place for you to tack it, and then hold it in place as you're welding and then as it cools off. Now, I want to say here that it's important that you don't over tighten the clamp. You don't want to have divots. You don't want the clamp to be digging in beyond the surface of the metal. You want the clamp to just be tight enough to hold it in place. Uh, hold it in place while you're tacking it so that way the piece doesn't move. And then of course as we're welding it so that way as the metal wants to expand, the, the clamp holds it in place. And then when we're done welding and that part starts cooling off, the clamps are still there to hold the metal in place so that way the metal doesn't want to change shape. So clamps are good to prevent distortion. Again, you just want to remember not to over tighten them. And then as we look at variating our welding technique, there's a few things that we can do. Something that we've already talked about is making less welding passes. We also want to focus on keeping our welds not too small, but then not too big. We want just the right sized weld. Maybe there's uh, a specification out there that is going to dictate how big our weld is going to be or how long it's going to be. One other thing that we can try is using intermittent welds. So instead of making a weld the entire length of the part or the entire length of the piece of metal, maybe we're just going to put some stitch welds every so often. So they're going to be evenly spaced. This is going to reduce the heat input. It's also going to reduce the surface area where the forces of expansion and contraction are going to want to push and pull this metal out of shape. But you're still going to have enough weld material in there to hold the pieces together. And then you can also use a technique called backstep welding. And so we see an example of that in this image. Now this example is of a groove weld, but you can also use this technique with fillet welds. This is the very end of your weld, and this is where you would want to start your weld. So the direction of travel is right here. You're going from this end to this end. But instead of starting at this location and then welding on to this side of the metal, you're actually going to start about right here, weld till you get to the end, and then you're going to skip a little bit forward here, or you're going to backtrack essentially, start your weld, and you're going to finish your weld where this first one began. And then backtrack even more, start your weld, and you're going to end your weld where the second one began. Backtrack again, 
your fourth weld begins here, and your fourth weld is going to end where your third weld began and so on and so forth. So basically you're just backstepping across the plate and welding up until the point where your previous weld began. So this is going to affect the distribution of heat because if we were to start at this end and continuously weld, the heat is gonna travel with you and once you get to the end, that heat has nowhere to dissipate except in this one small area. So by backstepping our weld, we're changing uh, the way that the heat is applied to this part. And then let's talk about heat sinks and chill bars. So essentially this is just using another piece of metal and we're laying it either behind, on top of, or however we need to connect this metal to the part that we're welding and we're just using it to pull heat away from the welded area. It doesn't disperse into the part more than it needs to in order to prevent distortion. This is great for maybe thinner pieces of metal, maybe using a lower current, a faster travel speed just isn't enough to prevent distortion. It could also be used with, uh, say, metals like stainless steel, where you want to use something to pull the heat out because we know that distortion is probably going to be more prevalent in stainless steel than it would be in carbon steel or aluminum. It can be used uh, with thin metals, thicker metals, doesn't really matter. Typically, your heat sinks and chill bars are going to be made of a material with a very high rate of thermal conductivity higher than the material that you're actually welding on. So in this first example, it might be a little tough to tell, but this is a corner joint being made with stainless steel. And we have three different chill bars being used and they're all made out of aluminum and they're all clamped on various sides of the joint. So that way the heat is mainly just being focused where the weld actually needs to, to occur. So by limiting the heat to just one area, we are preventing an uneven heating of the part, which is going to lead to less expansion and less contraction. And we can see in this example, this heat sink or essentially chill bar is made out of copper and it's going to be used for a corner joint between two pieces of aluminum. And so same concept here the copper is going to pull heat away from the part itself. So that way the heat is more present in the well than it is in the heat affected zone. By limiting the heat to just this small area is going to lead to less expansion and less contraction. And in here we have an example of using a chill bar with very thin material. So this welder is going to try welding two razor blades together on the sharp edge, which is the thinnest point of the razor blade. And they're, they're using what's called a third hand or basically just another piece of material to hold them in place against an aluminum block. So this block of aluminum is acting as a chill bar. So that way it's pulling heat away from these two very thin pieces of metal so that way the heat is only in the welded area less expansion and less contraction and let's talk about another thing we can use something called a strong back these are pieces of very rigid metal you would connect these to the parts being welded by either tack welds or full length welds. They would typically uh, be attached on the back side. Sometimes you can apply them to the front, just depends on what the application is. And their sole purpose is just to keep the metal in place. So you would, you could use strong backs in applications where it's just not feasible to use a clamp. Maybe the pieces of metal are so big, 
that no matter what clamp you try to use, it's just not going to work. So if you find yourself in a position where no matter what clamp you have or how you try to clamp the metal in place, it's just not going to work, try opting for a strong back. And so again, you can tack weld these to the material or you can apply full length welds. And it's, it's just the same concept of using a clamp. It holds the, the two pieces in place or however many pieces you have, it holds them in place as you tack weld the parts together, as you weld the parts together, and as the parts cool off. It's just gonna pre prevent them from moving around. It's gonna control the forces of expansion and contraction, which like I said, prevents distortion. They come in many different shapes and sizes. Uh, some of these you can buy, some of them you can make on your own. So like I said, oftentimes strong backs are made of the same material as what you're welding. So if you just have a thick plate of steel and you happen to be welding steel, you can make your own strong back. You can, you can be the one to say, I want my strong back to be this size, this shape, this thickness. In this case down here in the second image, this welder is putting two plates together. So the weld is running down the middle. And these pieces of angle iron are acting as strong backs. So as this welder deposits a weld along this, this edge right here, along this, this groove, the, the plates could want to curl upwards towards the surface of that weld. But by having these angle iron strong backs in place, they are going to prevent the distortion of these two plates. I, I do want to make a note here that a lot of these different techniques can be used at the same time. You might find yourself in a position where maybe changing your technique just isn't enough. Maybe using clamps just isn't enough. Uh, maybe using strong backs just isn't enough. You can always use them in combination. You can use clamps and changing up your welding technique. You can change up your welding technique and use strong backs. You can use preheat and with any of these techniques. You can use post heat with any of these techniques. These are just multiple options for you to employ in order to prevent distortion. So if you feel like you need to use more than one of these methods, by all means, please feel free to do so because you don't want to put yourself into a situation where you've just welded something, there's a whole lot of distortion, and now this part can't be used because it's just not going to serve the purpose it was intended for because there's so much distortion. And so here, I just took some time in our welding shop to weld some some joints together to try to give you an idea of how distortion uh, can occur and how it looks. So to start us off, I just made a T-joint out of one quarter inch carbon steel using 718, about 140 amps, and I just had one single pass. Now, after letting it cool off for about 45 minutes to the point where I can touch it with my bare hands, I took a speed square, and I measured it for squareness. And so you can see that this vertical plate kind of pulled itself, it got pulled over towards this, this weld. So even though there was only one single pass, maybe my current was a little too high for the thickness of this metal. And so we see quite a bit of distortion here. Now for my second T-joint, I increased the thickness of the part, so from one quarter inch to three eighths of an inch. I still used 718, I still deposited one single weld, and I kept my current the same, about 140 amps. And again, after letting it cool for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, to the point where I can grab it with my bare hands, you can see that while there is a little bit of distortion, you can see there's a little gap up here towards the top, it's not quite as bad as it was with one quarter inch plate. 
And here we have a, uh, a T-joint, 3 eighths of an inch, 718, uh, but I, I deposited six welds instead of one. And so we can see on this uh, second image that there is more distortion than with one single pass. So I could have prevented this by maybe putting a tack weld on the backside, maybe somehow clamping this vertical plate in place. Um, depending on the application, if I'm able to put welds on the backside, then I would have put welds on the backside. Sometimes you might not be able to do that. Sometimes the only place you can put a weld is on one side and one side only. So this, this is just a, a situation where you want to think about the things you can do to prevent distortion. Maybe I could have applied some preheat to this part. And then I have another T-joint again, three eighths inch material. I still use 718. I still used approximately 140 amps, but I used a backstep welding method. So this is where my well, where my welds ended. This is where they would begin. My first weld began here, ended here. My second weld began here, ended here. And my third weld began here and ended there. And so we can take a look at the next image that it's pretty square. There might, I mean, there could be a little bit of distortion, but I really can't tell in this image. So just by changing my technique and my technique only, I was able to reduce distortion. Now we have a groove weld. So this was a V groove. It, this, this first weld, um, or this first groove weld was on half inch plate, still using 718, and it took me six passes to fill this groove. And I put it in this little fixture, uh, so that way you can kind of tell how the plates are bending upwards towards the surface of the weld. And in this second slide for this particular weld, I used the same square, put it right on top, and Despite there being some weld reinforcement on the surface, the, the square was still able to sit flat against either side. And you can see this big gap right in the middle. And you can see that the weld doesn't make contact with the square, which shows us that this weld or this weldment has pulled itself upwards towards the surface of the weld. So this is a case of distortion occurring in a groove weld. Now the same type of groove weld, but in 3 8 inch plate, it took me approximately four passes to fill this in. I still use 718. I use the same fixture and you can see that there's a little bit of distortion, but not quite as much. And again, using the same square, you can see that both ends of the square sit nice and flat across the surface of these two plates. And you can see a little bit of a gap here. And so while there is distortion in this joint, there's not as much. Now I have a couple of corner joints that I did. One at a carbon steel, one at a stainless steel. They're both the same thickness. And uh, so these two I welded with GTAW because they're, they're pretty thin. And so I have these side by side where you can tell that they're approximately the same thickness. I think these were both about 1 16th of an inch in thickness. And so this is after welding them. So you can kind of see some discoloration here along the edge. And so this is the heat affected zone. So in carbon steel, it has slightly better thermal conductivity than stainless steel. So you can see how the heat traveled through the, through the joint by the discoloration in the metal and with stainless steel having uh, less thermal conductivity than carbon steel. You can see the discoloration or the colored area isn't quite as big as it is with carbon steel. And so here is just a view from the top. And again, you can see the, uh, 
the heat affected zone for carbon steel it uh it ends you know a good distance from the actual welded area so i would say this is maybe like an inch away from the welded area and then with the stainless steel part you can you can see that the heat affected zone doesn't quite extend as far from the weld as it does with carbon steel and i use the exact same amperage setting for welding both i used 1 16th inch filler material when welding both i use the same gas pressure for both and i use the same tungsten electrode for both so my variables were pretty much the same when welding both both joints it's just the types of material that affect the heat affected zone and so we can see between carbon steel and stainless steel the, ther the, the differences in thermal conductivity now i didn't measure these for distortion i just wanted to use these two joints to uh, compare the the heat affected zones in different pieces of material so as the the rate of thermal conductivity and as the coefficient of thermal expansion changes from one type of metal to another, so will the risk of distortion. It's just one of the many factors we have to take into consideration. And so with all of that being said, and now we've reached the end of this video, the things that you want to remember are Distortion is caused by the heating and cooling of a part. As a part heats up, it's going to expand more. As it has to cool off more to get to room temperature, it's going to contract more. The forces of expansion and contraction are going to want to pull and push the, the weldment out of shape. If it takes on a permanent deformation, it's called distortion. There are a bunch of different methods to control distortion. Our welding technique, our travel speeds, our heat input with current settings. We can use clamps to hold our material in place. We can use um, heat sinks or chill bars. We can use strong backs. We can also use um, preheating and postheating to control distortion. There's a lot of different methods that we can employ to lower the risk of distortion. There's never a one size fits all. It all depends on what the application is, what type of joint you're welding, what is the part being used for. Um, this is an ongoing situation that welders are going to have to deal with in industry. So it's always good to look back and review what causes distortion and how to prevent it. And with all that being said, this is the end. Uh, thank you for hanging in there with me and I'll see you in the next video.